Wyoming and becomes its own state during the Civil War, which ends in 1865. So the following year, 1866, West Virginia establishes its first and only maximum security prison by building the West Virginia Penitentiary. Get out of the way, Trent. I will introduce you in a minute. <laughs> All right, what's up, everybody? My name is Shay. This is Grant. Thank you for watching our videos. Tonight we are at the Moundsville, West Virginia State Penitentiary. We're here. Um, so let me That's introduce no you to some other people that we brought with us. Uh, Ohio Ghost Hunters, y'all get in here. <laughs> <laughs> As everybody walks through, this is me. So we got Ohio Ghost Hunters here with us. You've probably seen uh, them a lot in our videos. Uh, and we're going to do a lot more videos coming up in uh, 2022. We just had a contest a couple months ago. And I want to introduce you to our winner, Tony. Get in here. Woohoo! <laughs> this is Tony. She's uh, a newbie. She's a newbie. Yeah, she's been very excited about this trip. And this is her son, Trent. He's also, he's going to be doing uh, some camera work for us tonight as well. So I hope you guys like this video. Like and subscribe. Are you guys ready? We're ready! ready. ready. Woo! Now this facility was open for 129 years until March 27th of 1995. And in the early years it was housing men, women, and children as young as 12, thrown in with general population. After 129 years, this facility was forced closed by the state uh, Supreme Court of West Virginia after they determined that it was violating the Eighth Amendment. Even as maximum security prison, it was considered cruel and unusual punishment. And there were many factors that led to that very fair decision, such as overpopulated inmates, rodent infestations that could not be controlled, uh, lack of uh, adequate, inadequate health care, uh, there was a lack of heat and air conditioning through most of the building. But what most notably got this facility shut down was for how violent it was known to be. In fact, the Department of Justice nicknamed this location Blood Alley. Now the hallway we're starting in is the 98 corridor, uh, called so because of the radio call sign. So the colored lines that you can see on the floor would help assist our free moving inmates uh, coming from general population of New Wall behind you. They could freely travel throughout the facility. So on the hour, every hour, very similar to how a high school exchanges classes, a bell would chime. And one unarmed 98 officer with a set of keys could come down and unlock all the doors. That way, general population inmates could travel within the yellow lines, whether they're headed to the recreation yard, the cafeteria, the law library, just to name a few locations. Another bell would chime 10 minutes later, and they would be placed on lockdown in that location for the next 50 minutes until that cycle started again and they could choose to move locations. Now, keeping the inmates inside the yellow lines just basically helped one to two officers to look over hundreds of free-moving, unshackled inmates as they understood they're vastly outnumbered. Now the red line had its own particular set of rules and it was actually only used for traveling back inside the cell block. It was particularly important to follow those rules during time of prison lockdown. The set of rules was actually titled the inmate walk. Every inmate inside of the red line had to have their hand on the wall as high as they could reach. Their other hand was on the shoulder of the inmate in front of them. They were to walk forward slowly. They were not permitted to speak or to lift their vision, but most importantly, you are not permitted to step on or outside this red line. Because if you did, the officer in that gun box had permission to fire, no questions asked. Now you do kind of have to understand his job title. Armed with a 357 Magnum as well as a 12 gauge shotgun, his only job is to protect the unarmed 98 officer. The man with the set of keys is in too close of contact with the free moving inmates for fear that they may take his weapon and use it against him or someone else. He cannot carry a loaded weapon. Therefore, they place an officer in that box for his entire shift, and his only job is to protect the unarmed officer. However, that forces him to make a split-second decision. Did the inmate step over the red line in order to assault the unarmed officer, or did the inmate behind him trip up his ankle and shove him out of line? So unfortunately, many men lost their lives in this hallway simply due to a painted line on the floor. Now, during years of prison operation, uh, I, like I had mentioned, we were shut down due to the extreme violence that went through here. Uh, another real uh, nickname that came from this 
penitentiary was that everybody used to call us Rape City because a true fact is that 90% of our inmates would be sexually assaulted during their time here. Now, to give you a true feel of the violence here, I like to give a side-by-side -side comparison to the federal prison Alcatraz because many people are familiar with that name. Now, during their years of prison operation, Alcatraz has a documented death count which reaches 28 individuals. However, at our state facility, only running from 1920 to 1995, the documented death count reaches 998 individuals. Now, that is including our 94 state-sanctioned public executions, but it does not include any officers or staff or any inmates off the property at their time of passing. Now, as well, before the 1920s, we do have another estimated 500 deaths on the property. And just to top off our spooky factor, you may have noticed our neighbors when you enter today, that Grave Creek Mound Museum that resides across the street. It is an ancient Adena-built burial mound, and it's over 2,000 years old. Standing at just over 71 feet tall, it is considered the largest freestanding mound in North America, giving Moundsville its namesake. But you do have to understand the Adena people that build those mounds use them to celebrate the high chiefs in the tribe. Everyone else was usually buried in the surrounding area, like where we're standing now. So before <laughs> our maximum security prison history even begins, we're built on top of an ancient Indian burial. Now, the one issue that comes from recreation inside of West Virginia is basically inclement weather. If the inmates come outside and they see some snow on the ground, it can be mentally devastating for those men who are used to being outside for so long every day. Uh, in the early years, the penitentiary didn't handle that very well. They didn't really send those inmates outside in the snow. They would just be kept in their cells. Well, eventually, uh, the penitentiary did have to be reminded that there is actually a legal required amount of time for general population inmates to receive exercise daily. So because of that, a couple of officers found this room that we're standing in now being used as storage. They completely cleaned it out, and their intention was to use it as an indoor recreation room to avoid the inclement weather. Now, uh, understanding that the men would much rather be outside for all day rather than to have a short time span in the basement, they did kind of try to make it more appealing to these men. They put down here some sofas, pool tables, ping pong tables, arcade games. Now, they knew that with general population up to 500 inmates, they wouldn't be able to bring everyone downstairs at one time. As you can see, the room's not very large. The idea was to take about 150 inmates, bring them downstairs, let them have about two hours of recreation time, take them back to the cell block, grab the next group of men, let them have their two hours, and kind of cycle through until everybody had a little bit of rec time. However, the officers quickly realized that there was a lot of security issues with this location, as when it was built, it was never intended to house the inmates. So, for instance, the very low-level ceilings mean that an officer can never get a visual height advantage over the top of the inmates. As well, if you're an officer peeking your head in the door, as you can tell by all the pillars in the surrounding room, you know, a lot of this location is a complete blind spot unless you walk your way through. Now, as well, if you are one officer entering into a room with up to 150 inmates, you're too close to contact with the inmates who cannot carry a loaded weapon. Now, uh, basically, the officers realized it was extremely dangerous for them to check on the men down here. So they approached the warden, and they explained that it is very dangerous, and they, you know, say, well, what do we do about this? And the warden basically tells them it is not the warden's job to stop the inmates from, you know, fighting or stabbing one another, but it is his job to make sure that the officers go home safely to their wife and children every day. So the warden makes a new rule that the officers are no longer permitted to go in the basement. This location was barely supervised at all. And as you can probably imagine, the inmates learned rather quickly that no one was ever going to come downstairs to check on them. After an uncountable number of fights and stabbings and robberies, but particularly known for its extremely high number of sexual assaults, the inmates nicknamed this location the Sugar Shack. And that's not because there was candy from commissary down here. That's from the red lips. <laughs> <laughs> 
you'll see quite a, the artwork that I consider the tribute to the Sugar Shack, and oftentimes you'll find some in general population. Is, that here? Simple two hand prints. Uh, keep in mind that Gen Pop doesn't do strip search. So, you know. So literally, why was the artwork put there? Now, all the artwork that you see throughout the entire penitentiary was all done by the inmates. Artwork, supplies, and such like that was often used as a reward system. Uh, but I will say the only piece of artwork that is not original is seen down here in the Sugar Shack. There are these gray Mothman shadow type figures. These were actually placed here without our permission on historic state property by MTV Sphere. Now, this way, they use this to falsify evidence. So we wow. keep them here for two reasons. For one, because if we add extra paint, it doesn't make it any more original. But as well, uh, we like to let everybody know that if you come and falsify evidence as a major TV show, we will tell everybody that you're a liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> now in this location, we do receive a lot of, um, I don't want to call them orbs, I'm going to call them light anomalies. An orb is going to make you think that it is perfectly circular and it can easily be explained away by dust or bugs. And in this old of a building, there's no way to say it's not dust or bugs. So uh, I like to refer to it as a light anomaly. Oftentimes in pictures down here in the Sugar Shack, people will capture this very bright neon orange streak across the photo, almost resemble uh, like a streak of flames running across it. We do have an example upstairs in the gift shop if you'd like to check it out. Now as well, our biggest issue down here is usually the shadows that roam around. Uh, oftentimes during our haunted house, we do have a lot of issues keeping haunted house actors downstairs. This uh, location is used for a boat ride on the River Styx, so we do leave a cooled, low-level fog on the ground, but as a lot of customers come through and a lot of body heat comes through, that fog will often rise up a little bit higher in the room. Our actors will often describe that they saw a customer walking through the fog and they get prepared to scare them, and as soon as the figure approaches, it disappears right in front of them, oftentimes leaving our haunted house actors very uncomfortable to return the next weekend. So uh, we have had a lot of reports and pictures interesting down here. As well, this location does get a little touchy-feely from time to time, as you could probably imagine, the residual energy downstairs. Fair warning to the ladies. Uh, notice your tour guide has put her hood up. This location is what we call the Bat Cave. Uh -oh. oh my god, check this place out. Now prior to the 1950s, this location was used as solitary confinement. Uh, you'll quickly notice there's no cells downstairs because these men were simply chained to the wall in a standing position for up to 30 days. They were provided with two buckets. One is how water enters your body and the other is how it exits your body. Now, there was um, a couple of issues using this location as solitary confinement because, once again, it was never built to house inmates. Now, uh, there was never electricity run downstairs at the time, so the cockroaches would overtake this location. As well, during times of very heavy raining, it does tend to flood, sometimes above the knees of the inmates. So now, think about the buckets that are containing everyone's human waste. Now, that's all floating up around, and the cockroaches are seeking the inmates as some of the only dry land. Now, there was one warden here who was known for taking punishments on the inmates a little too far. Warden John Peck was not only known for harsh punishments, but for his inventions of torture devices to be used on the inmates. Most famously known for a device he called the Kicking Jenny. This was a wooden half arch, basically a warped over piece of wood. Inmates would be stripped completely naked, shackled by their ankles on one side, bent over that half arch, shackled by their wrists on the other. Now, unfortunately for shorter inmates, the device is, for lack of a better term, one size fits all. So they would have had to stretch you know, shorter inmates far enough, they probably would have had a hip or a shoulder popped out of place before the torture even begins. Now, the night before, either the assigned officer or the warden himself would take a three-inch wide leather strap and soak it in vinegar and or salt water. Now, before the torture begins, they remove it from that bucket and dip it into a bucket of sand. Now it is the job of the assigned officer or the warden to continually beat the bare back of the inmate, usually causing the skin to swell so bad it was described as tearing like wet paper. 
This would continue either until the officer was totally overcome by exhaustion and could not continue, or until the inmate passed, whichever came first. Now, Warden John Peck was actually asked to step down out of his position of warden once the state of West Virginia discovered he had an average of two inmate deaths by torture per month for over two years. Now, they did close down this location for a couple of years, but in the mid-1950s, they reopened it again to be used as a maintenance and boiler room. Now, the warden at that time, it was no longer John Peck, uh, he basically found what he considered to be a trusted inmate, and he basically made a deal with him. Uh, he told the inmate that if he was willing to stay within close proximity of the boiler system and work on it any time that it broke down, that the warden wouldn't make him stay in a cell. He would give him his own apartment downstairs. Now, that inmate's name was Robert Daniel Wall. He called himself R.D., but the other inmates called him the warden's favorite snitch. Now, you do have to understand that R.D. basically had a target on his head from day one as he entered the penitentiary with a rape charge from Logan County, and the inmates here were highly protective of women and children. This is something I cannot accentuate enough. Now, on the morning of October 8, 1979, a couple of inmates witnessed R.D. whispering into the ear of the warden. For them, this was confirmation enough that he's officially an informant. That same evening, those inmates broke into this location. They found R.D. using the restroom. They drug him into the middle of the room, and they sliced his throat so deep they nearly decapitated him. Now, when he didn't show up to count the next morning, the officers had pretty much already known what had happened, but they did come downstairs to find the very grim crime that is committed. Now, if you guys are ready, we're actually going to step right into R.D.'s room so we can check it out. I wonder if it looked just like this. Now, the room was a little different at the time, and the explanation of the room, I think, will uh, explain a little bit more why the other inmates were so resentful of R.D. It's one thing to not have to stay within your cell, but it's a whole other thing to gain your own apartment. As well, if you can see here on this back wall, there used to be a fireplace, and they would provide R.D. with wood to heat this location, which was salt in the wound for the other inmates that never received heat. As well, uh, on the floor you can sometimes see these circle patterns that are repeating. That was custom tile they put down here, so that was pretty nice. Now it is said that R.D. still resides downstairs, and he's a rather friendly spirit, but that's just the problem. Sometimes he's a little too friendly. He likes to let himself be known, usually through touch. Now for the ladies, they do often report a very gentle approach. Oftentimes women will report uh, their hair being tucked behind their ear, twirled behind their back, or a soft caress across the cheek. Now for the men that enter, they do experience uh, quite a different experience, as I could kind of understand why R.D. doesn't really like multiple men rushing into his room. Now some men will report that when they tried to enter into this room that it felt as though something grabbed their forearm, kind of as to say, you don't want to go in there. And as well, every once in a while, the men that will make it back towards that area where R.D. was found using the commode, they will report a stabbing sensation to the rib cage. Now, one other occurrence that happens downstairs, enough for us to call it reoccurring, is that cell phones tend to act very strangely in this location. Now, keep in mind, the side of the building was constructed in 1866 with thick, heavy sandstone. So not being able to get good service to make a phone call is not what we consider paranormal. Uh, but I personally have witnessed uh, batteries drain in almost an instant. Uh, people's phone turn into black and white or unrecognizable languages. I've seen people's uh, phones start playing music or reading GPS directions. In fact, a couple of weeks ago during our Halloween season, a gentleman standing right beside me with both of his hands on his flashlight, his phone started reading GPS directions. And out of curiosity, I asked him where the GPS was directing him. And he said, oh, I don't know, I'm not local. It says something like Tom's Run Road. That's the location of the prison cemetery. Oh, mm. wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So cool. always check your phone downstairs. It does some goofy stuff. <laughs> now we're going to head outside. We're going to travel through administrative segregation cell block. It's officially titled North Hall, but the inmates often called it the Alamo because it was said to be their last stand. Those men are considered the most violent across the entire state, so they are kept on 23-hour lockdown, eating all three of their meals inside of their cells. They can only be released for one hour of recreation, but inside of a secured cage. So we're going to walk through and travel to North Hall. Off and separated from the rest of the block. That's what housed our gang leaders, or the inmates that are labeled as the most influential. They are kept away from other inmates for every moment of the day. They are kept in their cells by themselves, their shower location is separated, and they do have to come out to recreation by themselves, even though other inmates in North Hall can come out four men at a time. 
Now, the very first cell we'll be passing was occupied by a man named William A. Snyder. His nickname was Red, and he was the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood. Said to be one of the most feared yet respected inmates that's ever been housed in the penitentiary, Red often liked to establish his dominance when new officers started into North Hall. Red would often politely introduce himself and then politely introduce the officer, using his first and last name, his social security number, home address, license plate number, the name of his wife, the name of his children, what school they go to. So Red liked to let everybody know from day one who was really in charge. Now, two cells down from Red was his very good friend, also a high-ranking member of the Aryan Brotherhood, Rusty Lassiter. And the only freedom that the officers allowed those two men was to come out to recreation together. Because although marked as gang leaders, they should have come out by themselves, they were members of the same gang. So the officers didn't really have a fear that there would be a turf war inside of one of these bullpens. Now, for many years, it did seem as though Red and Rusty actually kept each other out of trouble. They both understood this was a freedom that was not supposed to be granted to them. As well, if one man broke the rules, they would both permanently lose that freedom. Now, for many years, Red and Rusty did keep each other out of trouble, but that all changed in 1992. They opened up the two cell doors to let Red and Rusty outside to go to the recreation yards. And as a power play move for the leadership of the Aryan Brotherhood, Rusty Lassiter stabbed Red Snyder 37 times in the face, throat, and chest. Red asphyxiated on his own blood and passed away just below his bunk that will be passing by. Now, still to this day, uh, people do every once in a while will report that a man with a raspy smoker's voice tends to whisper their own personal information or family give a nickname into their ear when passing by Red Cell, making a lot of our customers very uncomfortable. We oftentimes just like to say that sometimes Red just likes the attention. Usually if you say, hi, Red, he'll leave you alone. Now, I know you heard this story on day tours, but there was one tiny detail I did leave out. The very day that Rusty Laster stabbed Red Snyder, was November 16th, 1992. <laughs> Guess what happens at midnight tonight? You guys wow. have had a very special day. Woo! So yes. we walked through earlier, we read, uh, left, left read a cigarette in his cell to maybe perk him up for the night. So we'll see how it works out for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Red. bodily fluids. That was actually used because the men on the upper tiers would often throw things down here at the officers and sometimes they would actually light those items on fire before they threw them down. So a lot of those popular items included things like your mattress but uh, some of those things also included your cellmate. <laughs> so as you come down and you see how many times this is dented, you could probably imagine the weight of a thin mattress pad cannot accomplish that. Oh wow. And then you can see the line all the way in both directions. Cell number nine is my favorite. I'm sure you, I'm sure you probably noticed how glorified that cell is on the big map. I do want to head upstairs into the infirmary. That's our medical leading into our psych ward. Now, a couple of things about upstairs. Please hold the handrail on the way up. Our residents upstairs are ankle grabbers, and usually somebody gets a little tousled up and down the steps. As well, upstairs, any artwork that you see is original to prison operation. Any medical equipment that you see is original to prison operation. But that being said, a stain on a mattress is also probably original to prison operation. <laughs> now, upstairs is also known for the bats. So be careful. About two weeks ago, there was a turf war between like the bats and the raccoons upstairs. Uh -oh. bats were winning. <coughs> Any of the artwork you see upstairs was done by the same inmate, Danny Lehman, the leader of the Avengers Motorcycle Club. Now it was discovered uh, that Danny was having some adult relations with a nurse upstairs, and that's why he spent so much time up here. Marked as a gang leader, he probably should have been kept on 23-hour lockdown in North Hall by Red. Uh, but as you can tell from how many paintings are upstairs, he spent a lot of time up here. <laughs> now, it was discovered but he was having those relations with the nurse by another <coughs> inmate. And unfortunately, that inmate snitched on Danny. 
Now, Danny was no longer allowed up on the second floor, but coincidentally, the next morning, while Danny was on 23-hour lockdown, that same snitch inmate was found dead in the south yard. Oh, wow. Now, the room over here with the plexiglass is the dentist office, so a specialized um, doctor like a dentist would have only arrived about once every two weeks or so. Usually, there would have been about an average of 35 inmates up here, and that would have been manned by four nurses and one on our box. on the other side is used, for lack of a better term, kind of like a drunk tank. Uh, if an inmate comes up and he's a little too violent or the nurse is kind of waiting for medication to take hold, she can visibly see him in the room without having to dangerously enter it herself. Now this room contains our x-ray machine and the original dark room to develop the x-rays. Uh, fair warning, if you are a lady, this is probably the number one location for you to get grabbed. The room with the door removed was the number one location to break into during a riot. It is the pharmacy. Now this room would have basically been filled with just beds of sick inmates. Now up in this uh, area, this first open room and the next, we do receive a lot of auditory evidence up here, whether it is recorded or just heard with your natural ears. So we do like to go over what we consider a normal noise within the infirmary. So for instance, on this side, uh, the entire way down the hallway, that those windows are facing the main road, Jefferson Avenue. So you may possibly hear a car driving past, a radio playing, or a car horror honking, something like that. If it's coming from this side of the room and there's a window missing, it simply could be the community members outside. As well, during times of rapid temperature change, we do have a lot of uh, metal in the ceilings. So you do get the old uh, the pops and clicks and the settling of an old building type of sounds. But you'll very quickly uh, realize what's normal upstairs and what's not. This location is known for something that pounds on the windows seemingly from the outside. A lot of people report that it sounds like something picked up a handful of rocks and tossed it across the room. And then as well, uh, this location is known for a set of footsteps that will very quickly run right behind you. You'll turn around and see nothing there. And I've actually had it turn around and I've watched nothing run back the other direction. Now this red door here is what separates the SPU, the Special Programs Unit. So this is what we consider the site. Now this location uh, as well does have a lot of auditory evidence, but it also has something that's been uh, reoccurring more frequently this season, it seems. It's something I like to refer to as the peakers. Now oftentimes I'm the only person facing the opposite direction of the tour, but I don't know the exact moment when a shadow figure peeks from behind me down that hallway because everyone on tour will look at me like this. <laughs> and that's not a comfortable feeling. So they will describe that one or multiple full-bodied shadow figures will simply lean out of the door and kind of peek at the tour real quick and then pop right back inside. Now, out of curiosity, I always ask everybody exactly where they saw the shadows and almost every time they name the same location. It is the doorway that contains our suicide watch tanks. Now feel free to follow me to our suicide watch tanks. <laughs> feel free to step in if you'd like. It's just a small room, so I like to give you guys a front review. I remember the night that Elton come in here and opened this door. <laughs> that thing open up. So I was so thrown off. I literally almost said nothing for a good like solid thirty seconds because that's never happened. So I didn't have like a protocol for what to do or say. Like, right. So I just kind of stood there politely for a minute, pulled out my cell phone, taking pictures. <laughs> Now those tanks we do keep locked because they have a funny habit of deciding when they like to open and close or lock somebody inside. Now uh, those were used for kind of like a sensory deprivation suicide watch tank. Any inmate put on suicide watch would be stripped completely naked as to have nothing to harm themselves with. They would be locked in the tank for up to eight hours or longer if need be. It was at the discretion of the nurses. Now, uh, inside the room is a simple shower head, shower drain, so you can kind of piece together where your human waste goes for eight hours. Now, inside the room, medically, they are designed to echo so intensely that all you can really concentrate on is the sound of your own heartbeat or your own breath. And they thought that would be calming. Turns out it does exactly the opposite. <laughs> Now, oftentimes, I like to invite people to knock on those doors because a lot of the times they will receive a response, whether it comes from this door right here or, oddly enough, the nurse's station right next door, and we're not sure of the significance why of that. Oh, no. You're going to knock to check. you got to make sure they're alive. You alive? No. You alive? No. 
RD, would you uh, please like to communicate with us? Uh, we come in here to see you, and we mean you no harm. Um, we're not here to hurt you at all. We just want to find out what happened to you. Can you say hi to that guy sitting right there in that chair? R.D., are you down here with us? No. Was this your quarters down here, R.D.? Is this where you stayed? This is where all the inmates used to make all the food. This is, I guess, this side is where they did all the dishes. was is there any inmates back here with me if there is can you make a noise do something to let me know that you're back here Anybody ever comes 
to Moundsville State Prison and you see this, screenshot that and send me a picture of it. I want to know what that noise was. Is there any inmates in here that would like to talk to us? Betcha this was an office or something. That's an exit sign. I guess that goes out. Yeah, like those outdoors. We're not gonna go out there though. It's cold. <clears throat> what is your name? Hello? <clears throat> many, many, many inmates walk this line. They spoke in here, in that hole right there, to tell them what they wanted. And then they got their food right here, I'm sure. They slid their food out here. Look at that. Look at that. That's a baby footprint right there. I don't know if you guys can see that. That's the footprint of a baby. Oh, that's strange. All right, this question is for the guards. From the time that you were here working, how many riots did you have to deal with? Did you see any murders in this room? Can you come and show yourself to us? We have a camera with us. Will you show yourself to us? Can we have a picture of you? RD, were you working on those pipes in there? Can you come out? R.D., come out. Sergeant Caldwell is up there. He'd like to meet you. R.D., This is just me and Tony. We're in Shadow Hallway. There's the door right there that um, a lady's seen a shadow figure up on that door. So we're going to... Let's go back to about where she's seen this shadow. Oh my god. My light just freaking died. <laughs> it sure did. Can you? 
you come out and show yourself now. Y'all, it's like so dark in here. <laughs> oh my god. Now turn that one off. Yeah, we got this one right here. It's shining right there on the door. If there's any inmates in this hallway, make yourself known, please. My name is Shay. This is Tony. Hi. We are two females sitting here all by ourselves. I know you've been in this jail for a long time because I, this is prison. And I know you got a long time to go. Most of the prisoners in here are in for life. We give you permission to touch us, but you cannot hurt us. So our men are gone. So we're in here by ourselves. But we're not going to be in here for long, though. Fifteen minutes is all you've got of us. So if there's anything that you want to do or say, you got fifteen minutes. Can you see us? If you come out into the hallway, we can see you. Can you tell us who you are? batteries on this light. Yeah. <laughs> and do. do you have any batteries on you? I uh, yes, I think I do. Because if this light goes out, we're fucked. <laughs> yeah. They call you the Shadow Man. <clears throat> do you like that name? Do you like that nickname? Does that make you feel sexy? Does it make you feel manly? From that picture I saw, you're an awfully tall guy. You're a pretty big dude. It has the trap door and has the noose. Does it really? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Remember that close part you saw the gift shop? So I was filming, couldn't see anything, and then the stopped right here because you couldn't figure out where the door was. So. <laughs> <laughs> it shut down, and I was just like, I know. The new swing. Did you really? There it is. There's the pull cord. Right here's the pull cord. I get you. Two green lights. Batch. Come on. Pull the cord. And we give you the trap door. Look. Oh my god. And you can see the blood on it. Holy oh, no. shit. It has blue. It, huh? It has blue paint on it. Oh. Oh. So, they use her. Yes. I'm Starla. I'm the case manager for OGH. Hepatitis or something. Oh, she's <laughs> <in my ass. laughs> They're sticking money. <laughs> oh. <laughs>
going to give you all his money. <laughs> We're married, that's all right. <laughs> okay, you already did. <laughs> hey, you got to hook the leg. And then tomorrow, oh, baby, tomorrow. tomorrow. Right here. Right here. You show us how it's done. Should I take I don't even know. Okay. claps you got? I don't have any left. Oh, well, why'd you waste them for? Oh, it's me. It's me. Oh, she she died. Sucker punched her. Back <laughs> <laughs> in the nose. Right, so you're going to use 
sorry, I couldn't resist to behold the millipede. <laughs> you know, when you grab somebody's boob, let's you know, you just pinch less. Just you know, give it a little. Yeah. Have you heard of foreplay? Yeah. <laughs> you know, foreplay.
Wait till these doors pop. Hundred on the block. Dude, you could touch this if you wanted to. That's because you can't find that shit. Your mom. Oh, no. I heard you had any. Your mom tried to name you a girl's name. It's so small. I, I'm sorry, but I can't hear you. I don't speak bitch. Shut up, Penelope. <laughs> Look, Penelope. You know damn good and well you're the bottom. The bottom? Hell yeah, I've Don't seen you in the showers. I'm going to a fat ass mom when she tipped me over. <laughs> Dude, you're oh, up. We're going to moms now, huh? <laughs> you're up, face. You look like somebody shaved a dog and made it walk backwards. <laughs> you look for your sister. It blinks like a jellyfish. Dude, so does your sister, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> It's okay though. She's got my kid now. T see how she's doing for me. My sister, she is the best prostitute in all of Kazakhstan. I don't own her now. I've been getting the money for some time. I know. She is best prostitute. She has hair everywhere. You have no idea. The prostitute is going through. Up for lip. Only the gay guys talk so much in this cell block. You still talking shit down there? I think that was Mr. Kakistan. <laughs> he really got it, but when he pulled him down his pants, it had already come off loose. You know why they call him Kakistan, right? Why? He took the cat, then he stand up. <laughs> Your anus is so loose that when the wind blows, I hear the heads on Easter Island whistling. You know, the best part of you ran down the crack your mama's ass and ended up as a stain on the bedspread. Your mother took a shit and realized it was you. You know, the one mistake that I feel like your mom made is she should have just stuck and given him a blowjob, but God, now we're here. There's something he said for swallowing. Your mother realized she screwed up when she fucked your, fucked your brother. Say it without stuttering, King of <laughs> You ain't got a dick in your mouth. Because the K2 went, or the rim pod went off. Wow. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, he now, what are you doing, right? Huh? He finished all right. That's good. That's why you're so quiet. He's <clears throat> jacking off, listening to everybody. Isn't that right? monkeys in my country where I come Kid, from. every time you talk like that, the REM pod goes off. He must like your Abbekistan. It's bananas. Maybe he likes your accent. I think you're dressing like horrible cleaner, man. Horrible <laughs> cleaner? What, what is this cleaner you're speaking of? So many times, you backstabber. Fuck you. I protected you forever. Snitch. Snitch, Snitch to the day you die. And all God the fucking bitches. mother whore. The last thing you did in life was still fucking snitch. This is why you got stabbed. You got stabbed because you were a good fucking mother whore. <laughs> Says you're Mr. A mother whore. Hey, Borat, why don't you shut the fuck up? I'm pretty sure you got a goat in your cell. What is wrong with goats? We 
don't fuck them here. <laughs> we, we milk them. We only fuck pigs here. You milk them with your lips. <laughs> you suck them to the teeth. Like that's you're that's only what blood. your Sally. That's only what your cellmate tells you to get a blowjob. That's not a nipple. Get it out of your mouth. It's a nipple. <laughs> Very small. Suck in it. Oh, I like nipples. The more you guys were going at it, the more this was going on. Red and white. Are you two married to each other? No. Because yeah, they make pink. <laughs>
you got to do it. Man, I could not imagine being in here for 20, 30 years in these little bitty cells. Are you looking for shanks? Yeah. Makes me dizzy. Wow. Well, four tiers high. We're on the top tier. Making our way down. A618. Anything or hear anything in the background, um, comment below. This looks like in the dark, guys. to the chapel and we're gonna get married going to the chapel and we're gonna get married in here preaching today. I think we're a little late, but Chaplain, we can here? still use a prayer. Oh, there's a animal poop home. So there might be an animal up here. Oh, this was all their music stuff. Bridge comm system. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it could be that camera outside. Oh. Hello. Why did those lights just come on? I swear um, those lights were just on. I thought I saw I thought it was your your camera. No. I, I was just leaning over and when it did that. I swear those that. lights just come on by themselves. Preach it, Brother Trent. Preach it. Do we incarcerate? We are gathered here today because we don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> we have nothing else left to do here. Stop touching him, Johnny. This is the house of the Lord.
figure somebody might get out and enjoy Perkins one day. I hear patrons further away. <laughs> Come here to the Lord's house. Amen. Amen. Hear my voice and hear Woo! the Lord. Woo! <laughs> Don't laugh at the power of the Lord. <laughs> the Lord doesn't laugh at you in your weakness. Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, he didn't say he had a problem. I think that's just the red light district that they turned into. That might be your new quarters, ma'am. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's the red light guys this concludes our video for this evening at the Moundsville State Penitentiary I hope you enjoyed it and like I said if you hear anything in the background or seen anything in the background comment below make sure to like and subscribe to our videos and we will see you on the next adventure peace out peace.